Okay, perfect. So we can get rolling, guys. Thanks. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, today we're going to be talking about pit tag background and innovations. My name is Nick Porter. I'm a fisheries biologist at Biomark, and my colleague here is Matt Brower. He's the North America sales manager. So first of all, we're going to talk a little bit about about background, and then Matt will talk about some of the innovations. So first of all, we should just start with what is a pit tag? So a pit tag is a passive integrated transponder that has no internal power source. So these transponders will have a full lifetime of your subject, but it needs some kind of an external power to read that unique ID that's within that pit tag. And that's where we start to leverage the transponder or readers. So the way that the transponders or readers work is they create a electromagnetic resistance within a larger field from this handheld reader, like you can see here in the green. And then it sends over to the pit tag, which resonates at an exact frequency. And this frequency that we'll be talking about here right now is that 134.2 kilohertz. So what happens is the tag recognizes that frequency and then it sends back its unique ID code. And this is much like these tuning forks like you can see in this graphic. It sends out a specific frequency listening for that frequency. And here it might be worth clarifying a little bit on some of the um, intricacies with pit tags. So there's two different technologies here. There's full duplex, which has a continuous transmission, much like a cell phone, so each person can talk at the same time. And then there's a half duplex, which has this power listen alternation. So only one person can be talking at one time, uh, much like a two-way radio. So it's sending out the signal and then stopping, letting off the trigger, and then listening. And some of the other specifics surrounding the full duplex and half duplex, you can see in this graphic here, which include continuous transmission for the full duplex, typically smaller tags. The electronics are a little bit more complex and it can read both at slow and fast read speeds. So if you're concerned with fish coming down through or your animals coming down through an area and traveling very quickly past it, the full duplex is much better. The half duplex has that power listen, again, like that two-way radio. And they're typically bigger tags with a relatively simple installation and a slower read speed. So throughout time, there's been different frequencies of pit tags. Initially, there was the 400 kilohertz, which had a much lower read range. And this was mostly used for terrestrial anim animals. And it was introduced in 1984 to salmon, but since the tag was actually plastic on the outside coating, there was water intrusion issues, which then compromised the tag. Fast forward a few years, and there was the 125 kilohertz tags, which read a few inches. Um, they were still pretty good, a, a big improvement over the 400 kilohertz, but they were still not this ISO standard that we're using today. And as you can see here in red, those are non-ISO standards, and these 134.2 kilohertz are ISO standards. And this ISO standardization occurred in 1996, and it created a standard for all pit tags to be read within a certain frequency. And you can see here the half duplex tags have a read range of about 12 inches, where the full duplex tags have a read range of around 24 inches. So with time, technology's improved to where now we're near two feet of read range. So some of the different applications or transponders that we have are these handheld readers, like you can see in green here, an in-stream antenna, which you can see in the top picture, a litz cord antenna, which is highly versatile and it's a corded system. So you can create pass over or you can create a loop and do a pass through system. There's submersible antennas, which are fully autonomous, meaning that they have the battery and the reader all in one package. And those can be placed out at multiple different areas and you don't have to worry about a power source on the bank or anything like that. And then lastly, there's a shielded antenna, which in areas that are very noisy, it can block out some of that interference within that same frequency range, such as at like a hydroelectric dam.
So here's the big question is why, why should you update to the new technology, say that you have the old 125 kilohertz tags? And the big reason behind this is that not all readers are created equal. Some of these readers that are older have a much lower read range and they could be frequency specific readers. So they might only be able to read that 125 kilohertz range. The new readers have much higher performance and most of the technology is driven at that 134.2 kilohertz within that ISO standard. This is also an area that would be good to clarify that many of the in-stream readers, the submersible and the lit cord antennas are all powered by a specific reader board that can only read the 134.2 kilohertz tags. And this, the way that we get such high performance is we have to only be listening to one frequency. Think of this like a spray bottle. If you neck this down and create a stream, it can go much further than if you tighten it down and have a mist listening to multiple different frequencies. You can't push the, uh, the necessary amount of power to listen for that large read range of two feet. So that's why these readers only read the 134.2. And lastly, it's easy to double tag these animals. So if you have a long lived animal like a sturgeon and you have some of these older tags such as the 400 kilohertz or the 125, you can read those tags, write them down and then over tag that fish with a new full duplex 134.2 kilohertz tag and use the newest technology while keeping all of that older technology as well. And with this, I'm going to switch over to my colleague, Matt, and he's going to be talking about some of the software technology innovations. Matt? Awesome, thanks, Nick. Uh, well done. So we have developed some new data collection software that is pretty cool. And so this is the data collection module or DCM, and this is actually a new wireless uh, data collection that has basically relies completely on Bluetooth. And so it actually Bluetooth talks to every single peripheral device. So Nick, if you go to the next slide for me real quick. So these are just some of the OS requirements that we have right now. We originally developed the software on the Android platform. And so when we started developing the software a few years ago, <clears throat> we basically started with Android 5.1. And so if you basically have a tablet already and want to basically load the software on there, it just needs to be Android 5.1 or newer. The cool thing about the software as well is that it has basically the ability to take pictures of whatever animal that you are tagging, animal or uh, whatever, you know, you can be out there tagging cactuses. Um, and so you have to have an integrated camera in, in the uh, the tablet itself if you want pictures. It also has a really cool ability right now that it will actually take a, a guess location of wherever the tag is scanned or wherever the record is made. And so if you want that basically capability, you also need to have a tablet that has an internal GPS. So we've messed around with doing some of the uh, mobile platforms being like cell phones and man, it just messes up the screen so bad. And so right now we have a minimum screen size of seven inches. And if you want basically a good backup for your data, we always recommend like a 16 gig internal memory of the tablet as well. Last, actually this year, well last year, 2020, we finished development of the Windows platform. And right now there is a lot of really cool Windows uh, tablets out there. Uh, we recommend uh, like Dell or like a Panasonic Toughbook uh, just because they're number one uh, ruggedized already. The actual Dell tablets right now, the 7212 and the 7220 have a really cool hot swappable battery in the back of them. And so if you need extended runtime, you can actually have like four batteries for this tablet and you have two of them charging in the truck and swap the batteries out uh, as you go. This one, I have not found a tablet with a, and an eight inch screen side that runs Microsoft Windows 10. Um, so pretty soon, I guess probably they will come out with a smaller eight inch, you know, than an eight inch screen that runs Windows. But right now the, the eight inch minimum screen size is right there. The 16 gigs of RAM just keeps it running fast. The 256 gig solid state drive, 
um, just really solidifies basically the data collection well. And again, if you want the GPS and you want the image, you will need to have basically the integrated GPS and the integrated uh, camera. Now, one thing that's important to note on these is that once you install the software, Wi-Fi is not needed. And so people ask me all the time if they need to get like a cell enabled uh, tablet, you do not. Um, the reasons why is basically after installation, you only are basically collecting data on the tablet itself. Now, when you walk back into the building and you get like a, um, a wireless signal or something like that, then essentially at that point, you can export the data off and then, uh, you know, email it to yourself. We are working on a version two of this software that's going to launch either Q3 or Q4 of this year. Now, one thing that's going to be cool about that is it will have a the ability to have a cloud network actually hooked to it. So we're working on a cloud database for this system. And so if you do have a cell enabled uh, uh, tablet, then essentially it's streaming data off of the tablet as you're taking it. Or if you don't have a cell enabled tablet, if you walk into the building, once you essentially have that uh, Wi-Fi signal, it's immediately basically pushing data off the tablet. So we're working on that and that's gonna be hopefully by the end of this year, we're working quite hard to get that done. Uh, Nick, go ahead and go to the next screen for me. So as I mentioned before, this is a 100% um, wireless Bluetooth uh, device. And so there's no more wires. No more losing wires, no more breaking cables, no more ripping cables, no more shutting cables and truck doors, because that's never happened. But the beauty of this is that every single one of these pieces, and I've went through over the years and identified a, a significant amount of Bluetooth peripheral devices, and this is just the start of it. I mean, this people, uh, this this the software's only been around for about a year and a half now, and so obviously the first choice is going to be your RFID reader. I wanted to point out though that this is not this software is not required an RFID reader. I mean, people were a pit tag company, so people think we're you know it's pit tag you know only. No, if you want to go out and measure trees, you can absolutely do it with the software, and so it's a total open platform that allows you to hook any peripheral device to it, make any custom data field that you want. And so some of them that we've identified obviously is the RFID reader, and then we actually developed a new electronic measuring board. And right now we have it in two lengths available that is a 50 centimeter and a 100 centimeter so half a meter and a one meter length measuring board that has basically a half a millimeter of accuracy um, scales were the tricky ones uh, scales uh, we've basically worked with ohas here um, and come up with they, they have two new bluetooth uh, modules that allow you to basically hook your scale up to a bluetooth uh, device and if you hit the print button on the scale sends that data to basically the tablet uh, calipers are actually um, <laughs> finicky there's only two calipers actually out there in the world right now one of them is made by Silvac out of uh, and the other one is made by Kern now Kern's a scale company anyway there's two scale two caliper companies out there and I did a lot of research and come to find out they're the same one's just sold in the US and one sold in Fowler is the other company um, they're both one sold in the US one sold in Europe uh, we're having a issue with the Bluetooth staying connected so essentially as soon as the device goes to sleep it actually disconnects from the tablet but they work they just don't work well yet but we're working on it uh, we have a barcode reader and this is actually really cool um, all our new TSU uh, uh, tissue sampling units which is our new genetic uh, uh, collecting uh, platform has a 3d QR code on the uh, on the bottom to excuse me a 2d QR code on the bottom of it that can be easily read and so this is what you're doing is you're taking all these different pieces and parts and you're collecting it all into the same tablet um, so yeah I mean that's the start of it right there uh, and there's probably going to be more stuff to come in the future. Nick, would you go to the next slide real quick? So this is kind of the whole thing laid out right there. Uh, obviously, you see the MK25 uh, implanter and the preloaded tray. So that would be your pit tag and RFID uh, connection. The scale in the center section right there, that's actually the OHAS navigator with the Bluetooth module. You can see the little Bluetooth module hanging out the back of it there. The TSU, um, that is going to be 
the tissue sampling unit that I was speaking of earlier, and that's the new genetic stuff. The little orange handheld there on the left, that's actually the, the 2D barcode scanner from a company called Socket that they actually design a ruggedized water resistance uh, scanner. And then you see the big, big, you know, electronic measuring board in the front. That's actually the small one. Uh, that's the 50 millimeter one. And then that's the little Samsung tablet running the software there in the front. Now, the re the beauty of this, again, is we're not smarter than these handheld readers. Um, we can't basically expect to take 13-digit uh, hexadecimal numbers or 15-digit numeric numbers and not make mistakes here and there. So the reader does that for us. I basically tell this to everybody. I, you know, we're not smarter than a handheld reader. You're eventually going to have some sort of transcription errors if you're still using pen and paper. Um, the nice thing with the software too is that you can really make a lot of custom fields to it. Uh, you can make drop down menus that for like quick acquisition, you can make certain fields what I call repetitive. And so if you're collecting, say you're on a raceway and you're collecting, you know, 5,000, uh, you're pit tagging 5,000 fish that day, but it, you know, you want to record which raceway you took them from and which raceway you put them in. So this is a super easy way. You can just make that data repetitive. So we took it from raceway three, we put it in raceway four. So you actually don't have to touch the tablet anymore. And so my goal was to make this software and tablet as autonomous, almost, uh, you know, autonomous as possible. I wanted it just to sit there and basically collect data. Um, you know, with having to touch it here and there. And so there's a lot of really cool trigger features that you can do to it, where if you scan a tag, it creates a new record, then you scan another tag, it saves the old record and makes a new one. And so it just expedites the process much quicker. Uh, we tagged 50,000 fish at Chief Joseph Dam in three days and ran it through this, the software through its paces. And I could take a 19 data fields and tag the, take the, uh, the, the, so we were scanning the fish, taking the, the the pit tag number, taking a length, taking a weight, and also recording uh, 17 other data fields, and I could process a fish every three seconds. So it, it, it really expedites the tagging process, and it eliminates any transcription errors. Could you go to the next slide, Nick? So this is kind of a, like a sample of the actual tagging screen itself. And so you see up there in the corner, you have the tag ID, um, you know, SRR for both is that's a I guess uh, nomenclature, it means species run rear. Uh, and so the, each of that, you know, if you click on the SR verbose, it'll bring up 20 different basically options. But this was just kind of an example of what the software actually looks like when you go. And so you can make like that station, you can make that repetitive. And so it just says station one, station one, station one, until you actually change it. Uh, you see the little check marks next to the software right there that indicates a valid field, you know, a required valid field. And so what that is, is you can make certain fields required. And, and so for a good example, like species is probably the best thing. You're not going to pit tag every, every animal, but at the same time, you want to record what species they are. And so you could make that a required field, meaning that you cannot actually move to the next, uh, the next tagging record until that's field. So go to the next slide for me real quick. So once you've collected your data, now it's what do you do with it? And so we have basically have it set up as to where you can export it out in an Excel file, a CSV file, and a text file. And you easily do that with just the of a button. And so you can upload it to, if you have like an access database, you can you know go Microsoft Excel CSV file, send that off, suck it into your database really quite easy. Uh, and then, Nick, go ahead and go to the next slide. I think I've just got like a sample. Yep, and so this is kind of what your data looks like when it spits out, and this is just an Excel file that I, I spit out real quick. Uh, gives you the time and the date. Now, the time and the date actually comes from the handheld reader itself. It actually does not come from the software. And so a lot of people, you can do like custom dates, custom times. So if you wanted to be, do like a holding time and a holding you know, temp and then do like a release time and temp, you can do that in the software as well. But it's important to note that that actual data stream actually comes from the handheld reader. Now the count right there, that what that is, is say you were out tagging Chinook, but you also want to just note that you saw 58 uh, spotted sculpin that day. And so you could you know, create a new record and in the count menu up there, just do 58 and it would say, oh, we, by the way, we saw 58 mo modeled sculpt on that day. Uh, 
yeah, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Obviously, I can go in for hours on this software and to the intricacies. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to email or call us and I could set up kind of a WebEx meeting similar to what we're doing now and should actually run through the software with you. I think the next slide is, yeah, and so this is our biologic site module software, which is actually something that's really cool. Uh, this was started uh, actually as uh, a project from my old company that I used to work for. and But it's basically real-time monitoring of like your in-stream antennas. So if you have 10 antennas and the, you know, somewhere extremely cold and you're sitting in your office in Boise, Idaho, drinking a cup of coffee and it's, you know, negative 20 degrees on your antennas, you can simply log into your site, look at your site health. You can download any data that's uh, like all your tag numbers. You can just basically pull all your tagging information and not physically going to have to go to the site. Now, this is actually powered via a cell phone modem or a satellite modem. So depending on obviously your cell coverage, um, the cell modems are much cheaper than the satellite modems are. Um, but you can do it. You can do it either way. So this is actually a nice tool to have. And so these are all this, the, the biologic site module is a monthly subscription where the biologic uh, data collection module is a yearly subscription. So these are all uh, annual subscriptions, um, but fantastic software for, oh, oh, by the way, we might have an antenna down. Oh, it's antenna five. Well, what's wrong with it? Oh, we lost current on the antenna. Okay. Well, that usually means something with the antenna is wrong, like a rock tumbled down and crushed the cable actually to the antenna. So this actually provides you with a lot of information to be prepared to go and make that 200 mile drive in negative 20 degree temperatures. So that's about all I got. Uh, Nick, did you have anything else you wanted to add? I'd say the last thing to add here would just be, you know, if you are in a system where you have some of those older tags, um, we do provide, or we do have one reader that does read all of these tags, and that's the HPR light. So if you're in an area such as the Great Lakes with maybe Sturgeon, who have a lot of these old 125 kilohertz tag tags, if you get one of those HPR lights, it will be able to read the new tags and the old tags. So if, if you're in that situation, just uh, contact us here at Biomark, and Matt's a, a great resource on a lot of this technology. Yeah, that's a good point. And I mean, we get that question quite a bit because uh, the 125 kilohertz is not an ISO standard. And so unfortunately, what happens is sometimes we run into the same tag ID multiple times. Um, and so we don't play that game. We basically stick with the ISO uh, ICAR uh, certification, which guarantees that if the tag is a 134.2 kilohertz, the tag will be read by a 134.2 kilohertz reader. And then the ICAR certification guarantees that tag is never repeated. So the FDXA stuff, they don't have any of the certifications. So we have seen it in the past where you've seen multiple tag IDs. Uh, but I mean, that's the way it goes. The nice thing is that these, you can basically, like Nick was saying, double tag these these animals. So to get the full performance out of our flagship tag, say the APT12 tag, that tag only needs to be right about a centimeter actually away from the FDXA tag. And the 134.2 FDXB tag screams so much louder than that FDXA tag does the 125 kilohertz tag that you will never ever see that tag actually ever again. Now, the, to Nick's point when he brought it up that you want to record this information on the A tag before inserting, that's a great point because I actually can't get an FDXA tag to read separately. So if you had like an FDXA and then you wanted to double tag it with an FDXB, they need to be around a foot apart on the animal to actually read both tags. So, cool. 